Hello, and welcome to How to Be a Better DM, a part of Session Zero Studios. My name is Tanner Wayland, and together we're going to learn how to have fun and manageable D&D games, whether you're a current or a future DM. So I've been wanting for a while to do a series on downtime activities, and today I'm going to start with the first of those. Since I feel like most DMs, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about, oh, planning the main adventure, the big baddies, the, you know, the items that the players get along the way. But we don't often think about, okay, what about when they beat that big bad and they have some downtime in between before you start your next, you know, story arc, so to speak. And that's what I'm hoping to kind of flesh out and and give you a reason to explore more. Um, And our topic today is something that I bet you probably haven't experienced. Uh, I, and I'm not saying that because like, oh, like it's really hard. I'm saying it's because it doesn't usually fit in with the typical uh, type of campaigns that people run. Um, and namely that topic today is about building a stronghold. Uh, now, as you can see already, not every campaign or party is right for building a stronghold. Or, And if you're wondering what I mean by that, I mean a base, a castle, um, a homestead. Maybe if you're going Swiss Family Robinson style, if you remember that super old movie, maybe it's a tr- a, a treehouse of some type, right? Whatever it is, it's a place that your players' characters can call home and that they can kind of customize to some extent. So why do I say that this isn't done all that often? Oh, well, a few reasons, right? Like if you if you plan on having your party travel a whole lot, right? You You aren't keeping them in the same region. Where, and they're not solving all these local issues. And it's more like, no, they go from region to region to region. You know, they're in a desert, then a mountain, then they're in space, <laughs> wherever. That might not be the, be the right fit for spending a lot of time and effort on your part or the player's part uh, to have a stronghold, right? Uh, now, uh, another situation where it might not be great is if your campaign's shorter. If you like to do kind of shorter campaigns, and then start over with a new party and do another short campaign. This isn't necessarily for you. You you could try a version of it, but where building a stronghold can really have a narrative impact, uh, that's typically where, you know, you're doing multiple uh, like campaign arcs with the same party and and ensure like uh, players switch in and out as, as they die. Right. Uh, Not players, characters. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, but either way, if you find yourself in that situation and you're like, hey, I have a pretty good, like long standing party uh, and, you know, and they kind of are staying together and, and we're having this long form story, please try it out. And, and I'll tell you why later on as we go about this. Um, first off, everyone loves customization. And that shouldn't stop with just your characters, right? Your players, they like to customize their characters, but they would also like to have more of an impact probably on the on the world building, on the landscape of the world itself, right? So uh, the best way to deal with that is just giving them a piece of land and being like, go crazy. <laughs> now, with some caveats there as well, you can't have them go fully crazy and just do whatever they want. But giving them some leeway and a specific place to kind of work their their plans and their desires on, that can be a really interesting flavor to add to your campaign. Um, now, in terms of like the actual rules, because you might be like, oh, Tanner, this sounds like maybe the homebrewed thing. Well, there are actual rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide, right? Uh, and first thing it says that you need to do, you need to get land. Uh, that could be a royal chat, a charter, a uh, land grant in, in the case of like, oh, someone's giving it to them just period, you know, not for money. Uh, that That's that's a great thing to do in terms of like a camp, like a gift or a reward for a quest. Uh, I, I think that that would be a wonderful departure from what typically happens, which is like, oh, you get money, you get gems, you get items. Uh, those are great, obviously, but but switch it up and, and like giving your players like, hey, you unroll an actual physical like like kind of, you know what you do, right? You get a scroll, kind of like put it in the oven, make it a little dirty, and then it says land deed on it or land grant. Uh, and suddenly they just own some of the land in your world. That would be a very special experience. 
uh, and a lot better than just being like, oh yeah, uh, look up this item. Yep, you got a you know you got a plus two you know battle axe or whatever. That that's fine, but it's not. It's going to feel very different, and I, I think your players will be very excited for that. So that's that's step one, right? You need that land. Now, if you buy that land, and let's say you do you don't get it through a quest, which you know that that's a fine way to do it. It's not my preferred way. I like to do it through like they achieved something and someone's giving out of gratitude. But if you're like, no, let's just have them pay for it. Typically a land deed uh, in the manual, in the dungeon master's guide, it suggests like for a small estate, it could cost anywhere from a hundred gold to a thousand larger plots of land for like bigger estates, maybe 5,000. And that's just for the land itself. Right. Because the second part of this is going to be the cost and the time for actually building the stronghold. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. And I would say a little bit, uh, a little bit messy in terms of actually like making it work for your campaign. And we're going to talk more about that, but okay. So after you get the land, you need two things. You need laborers and you need materials. And, and as far as it goes for the actual, cost of those materials uh, in that guide, it actually has a breakdown where it's like, okay, for a guild hall in a town or a city, 5,000 gold for, for the materials, just period. Right. But somewhere bigger, like a noble estate with a manor, uh, 25,000 gold pieces, right. Uh, An outpost or fort, 15,000 and a palace or a large castle, this one, it's 500,000 gold pieces. Good luck is all I've got to say there. Um, or it's just something more humble, like a trading post, 5,000. Temple, 50,000. You can kind of see where this is going. Like These are great estimates for like, it, it's a great way to make sure that your players understand the gravity of what they're building, right? It's not like they're buying a shield. It's like, no, you're actually building a whole building you know and that costs you know it takes timber it takes stone it takes all the expertise to actually create it so we'll get to like the complications of like how to get that later but um but yeah you can kind of see that there's already like some interesting opportunities here and also some interesting issues uh, because along with the cost, there's also time, like construction time. So that guild hall, which was pretty approachable, right? It's a guild hall in a town or city. It says it costs 5,000 gold pieces. The construction time for that is 60 days. But the, the guide actually clarifies. It says it's 60 days or it's you add an additional three days for every day that the construction isn't being specifically supervised by one of your characters. So as you can see, it's like, okay, when I say this is a downtime activity, it's fully a downtime activity as in a player character needs to be present actually at the construction site, directing the laborers and everything, or else it's going to lengthen bit by bit. Um, which, which I have issues with, uh, but but I get it because you kind of want it to be, you know, you don't want to give away something that you hope is meaningful for too cheap and without uh, enough effort. So with that in mind, here are some of the kind of some of the good parts about the process as described in the book and also some of the issues. And and we'll talk about how to patch those. But um, but first, in terms of opportunity, I, I like that they do have like gravitas for like the co- the cost and the timeline because I said that that guild hall co- uh, took 60 days for a keep or a small castle which typically would cost around 50,000 uh, 50,000 not dollars gold pieces uh, that would take like 400 days which you're probably like oh g- gosh I I don't think I've run a campaign that's gone like 400 days in 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 game time right so it, it's a lot, you know, but, but I like that it, it presents those kind of unabashedly and is like, what deal with it? Because I think that that gives you the DM a lot of uh, room to play around with. And, and also you won't be steamrolled by the players by being like, Oh, just come on, give us like 10 days downtime and it'll be built. No, it should take more. And that's where, as I'm going to get into 
you can do quests or, you know, get help in specific ways to kind of shorten that time. And I think that that's a great opportunity right there. Um, I also, once again, I mentioned before, I love the idea of getting the plot of land uh, because you did a great deed. Uh, like you, f- you saw the quest, you found the governor's daughter and he's like, hey, here's this, you know, small rundown estate uh, on the you know, outskirts of town. No one owns it. Please have it, right? That's that's a great story uh, development, in my opinion. Um, but some of the issues, uh, you've probably even thought of these as I was presenting it. First off, how on earth is the character going to access laborers? Because oftentimes, I, I mean... Unless you're a DM who's just godly and just every session adds like 10, 20 different uh, like NPCs to the whole narrative. Oftentimes, especially like in some place that might be a home base, which is typically a smaller area or a city, you might just keep character introductions to like only a few NPCs. And that's not enough to like be laborers. So that that's an issue is like, Hey, how are you narratively going to create a whole group of people that can work on, uh, on this stronghold? Uh, second cost, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's a big cost. Uh, now, so if you have some big payoffs, um, like maybe they beat the big bad and he happens to have, you know, 50,000, uh, gold pieces worth of jewels and everything else, then that's, that's an awesome, a resolution to that but in terms of like just the regular day-to-day stuff yeah like the, the player characters could never actually save up that much money so that so that's an issue um also there's the issue that maybe they don't want to spend that money there right because having stronghold is really nice narratively but it by the book it doesn't give you any benefits um it, it doesn't give you a, a buff when you leave or when you're there. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't suddenly make it so you have access to more like high powered items or anything, at least as written. Right. Um, and, and so maybe players would be like, uh, I'd rather just upgrade my equipment. And that's understandable if you just go as is. And finally, the, the last issue is just that the time to wait is so long. And and I know that I said that that's great because like the players should appreciate it, but it should feel like possible, right? Because if <laughs> think about how days go in your campaigns, how often do you, is it one session per day? I, I would argue that's pretty rare, right? Because it's usually like, oh no, one day is like three sessions because you're having a combat and an encounter uh, a combat and then you know a, a role-playing situation and then they're exploring a bit more and then another encounter and and you see where i'm going it usually takes some time and if you're doing like an hour or two sessions then that that means that like every two or three sessions is a day so if you're building even a trading post like a, a measly trading post which takes 60 days like let's just say 60 times two that is 120 sessions. So obviously you can't do this <laughs> just as is. Now, as I mentioned before, it is downtime. So you could do time, like employ time jumps there, but it's still not, you know, you, ha- you have to be very active in proposing that. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about ways that you can maximize on these opportunities and also like turn these issues into bonuses. But first, let's hear from our sponsor, Magic Mind. So I've been trying to make more of my time. And that means trying to be more meaningful by working out more. I'm trying to stay, just get better at staying on task at work. Sometimes it gets kind of dull. Uh, and also I've been trying to do more fun activities at night with my wife, like, you know, doing a puzzle or, you know, playing a game or going on a walk. And sometimes I just don't have the energy And I'd just rather watch TV with her, which that's not great to do weeks on end, right? And so I've been trying to change this and it's been hard, frankly. Uh, There's a lot of tasks that I'd like to do, but I just don't feel like I have the time. And that's where Magic Mind has really been helping me out. Uh, It's been giving me a lot of energy and focus. uh, And it does it in a way that I don't feel guilty about because it's not really a coffee substitute. Um, and I kind of, I, my thoughts on coffee are like, yeah, it's great in terms of the energy, but it does feel like a band aid, right? It feels like, Hey, I'm not trying to make a more healthy choice. I'm just trying to cover up the fact that I'm really tired. 
Um, but magic mind is trying to give you more focus and energy, but in a way that is very health focused, right? It, it, magic mind is a mental performance shot and that you can add into your current routine and it's designed to work better over the long term. Some ingredients even work best over a three to four day period so that you know you aren't slapping that bandage over your tiredness, but rather you're kind of making a longer term solution to give you more energy and focus. And it's in a more safe and realistic way. Uh, what I love about it is that it has great ingredients, right? That I don't feel guilty about having. Like it's got mushroom nootropics, adaptogens. It's also going to give me that uh, daily requirement for vitamins, uh, for vitamin C and D. Which, if you know anything about vitamin C and D, we aren't getting nearly enough of, right? Uh, unless, of course, you're spending all day out in the sun stuffing yourself with oranges. So <laughs> those are both things that you just need, period, and that we could all use more of. But along with those nootropics and adaptogens, it's just been proven that it can give you energy for just a much longer period. And it's going to do it in a way that doesn't have uh, any negative effects on your body. And I actually am very confident in saying that because if you're worried at all about the ingredients or the effects of this, it's actually been really well tested by third parties. So, you know, it's not influenced by the actual company itself. And it was also created with a scientific advisory board of doctors and researchers over the course of like 10 years. So, you know, it's not something that they threw together last minute. Uh, so if you'd be interested, they do have a limited offer for you to use. And it's just for our listeners and it can get you up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase. Use the code DUNGEONMASTER20 at checkout after you go to this website, magicmind.com forward slash dungeon master. Just spelled exactly like that. So remember, go to magicmind.com forward slash dungeon master and use the code DUNGEONMASTER20 at checkout to get up to 48% off or 20% or off if you just want to try a one-time purchase to test it. Uh, so thank you again, Magic Mind, for sponsoring this. And let's return to the topic of the episode, opportunities and issues with the stronghold building situation. Uh, so first off, I, I really want to encourage you, like, don't, don't introduce this by just pitching it to your players. If you know your players would like to, are the kind of people who'd be down for this type of thing, I'd, I'd recommend you spring it on them. Have them help someone in high, like in high places. Like maybe it's a king, could be a king, right? And then that royal charter that's like, hey, there's a there's a, a town uh, not too far from here, and there's an estate there. We'd like you to run it. And then suddenly that's the reward. Can you imagine how much your players would react? Oh, they just love it. They'd love the heck out of it. So please don't, don't preface this. Don't, don't do anything like that. Just launch it at them after, you know, kind of, uh, if you know that your party is the one that would do, do well with this, then just surprise them with it and see what happens. Now to deal with the issues, first off, we talked about access to laborers. I would recommend that, uh, if you have some NPCs that are already pretty fun, like they're, they're pretty fun and they don't serve a specific purpose anyway, then that's a great opportunity. If you're like, oh, I'd love for my players to have more reason to interact with this NPC. Th that's what, that's what you do. You basically like have that NPC, like walk into their life and be like, oh, what's she up to? And then the conversation naturally is like, oh, well, you know that I do construction and I have a whole team of boys over here that can help. That would be a great way to get them worked into that. Now, if you don't have some NPC like that, that's like really fun for that. What I'd recommend is just create a new group, right? Have your players like as they're asking around about it, about laborers, all of a sudden an NPC in the town that they know is like, oh, actually, I know these uh, seven brothers, these seven dwarves out in the forest. Uh, but instead of miners, they're construction workers. And and then you can be like really dopey and funny about it, right? Because they're they can have all the stereotypes of contractors, you know, and say like, oh, yeah, this beam ain't going to hold or, or something like that, right? It's a really fun, fun opportunity to turn the stronghold building process into less of a slog because as mentioned, you know, it's a lot of money. It's a long time. So anything you can, you can do to make it fun, I think that's great. Now for the second issue, uh, the cost is kind of astounding for all of these materials. And I would recommend... 
Uh, now, if you have plans, I mentioned the oh, the big bad has a hoard of jewels and stuff. If you have something like that in the near future, that's great. Just go with that, right? But if you don't, the next best option in my mind is to give to kind of break it down because instead of doing gold, right, you could have the NPC be like, "Oh, you got fifty thousand, you know, gold pieces on you." But then, like, obviously, when they don't have that, then the NPC could be like, "Okay." It can actually be reduced down to just uh, two thousand, but I need you get the these specific materials. It could be like, oh, I need like a bunch of uh, lumber, and I need rocks from this specific mountain, and I need you know just give like specifics so that essentially instead of making a monetary goal that they need to achieve, they need to achieve specific quests and make those connections. And that's going to make it a lot more interesting and a lot more attainable, right? Where you're like, hey, I'm throwing you a bone, but you still got to go through the work and go somewhere where there's going to be an interesting adventure. There's going to be twists. And then at the end, uh, they save a lumberjack who's like, hey, I've got a whole bunch of wood. How can I repay you? Oh, yeah, I'll get it sent over. You know, uh, that that's a great way to do it. Um, now, in terms of the the problem with how long it is i I would say reduce the time frame or be like hey it's going to be this much time unless and and kind of similar to how i was mentioning like oh they need these specific like three materials do something similar with leveling a lot of times we have either uh, xp based or milestone based and you know in terms of the time like time frame that the the guide gives you that almost feels like exp based right where it's like oh you just kind of got to get through it but if you were to make it like oh you needed to get these specific tasks done right you need to find a an architect you need to find a uh, uh, this type of material you need to find if you kind of present them as specific goals then you can treat it a lot more milestone based or if you do like give them like only like one or two requirements and they fulfill it then the milestone can rather be like story arcs. So like the first time when they leave to fight a mid boss, then they come back and it's like, Oh, we're about third way through boss. You know, that's, that's the, uh, what the contractor is saying. And then they go and they fight, you know, they fight a few bandits out in the country because they're trying to save a little girl. They come back and then suddenly the the contractors are like, oh, man, we're like two thirds of the way through. You see what I'm doing? I'm like, OK, making it less like literal time and more figurative time where it's like, OK, you need to feel like it took some time so that it wasn't an immediate gratification thing. But you can kind of fast track it in terms of not making it the literal 400 days to complete something. Right. So keep that in mind and also make it another great idea for this is it maybe incentivize them to start with a smaller building like trading post or, or a guild hall. And then from there, or, or even just like a house with like three bedrooms or something, right? Just something simple. And then encourage them through interactions with their contractors from time to time. Uh, to be like, hey, you could uh, build it for only this much more and basically offer an upgrade where it increases in size. Now, if you're wondering if this sounds a lot like Animal Crossing, the video game, yes, it does. (laughs) And that's what I'm proposing is just constantly like, hey, if you can't afford uh, like a 50,000 gold piece abbey that costs, you know, that takes 400 days to finish, uh, maybe you start out with a trading post build up a little bit till it's a tower and then from that tower to a keep and then, you know, turn that into an abbey or something. Right. Uh, Just think of it more incrementally rather than, Oh, you need to get all this stuff and it takes all this time. And then finally you got it because, because that's just overwhelming. Um, Now in terms of like strongholds, not having a specific, uh, a specific sort of benefit, I would say that there's a lot of benefits you as the DM can add to it. I would say that it would be a great place to kind of gather NPCs. As in, if you have like a fun NPC on a journey and they ha- they offer a specific sort of uh, tool or trade, like they, they're an alchemist, 
uh, let's say, or they're a Smith. Those are great opportunities to invite them kind of back to the stronghold and be like, oh, uh, basically suggest to the players like, hey, I'm looking for a new place to uh, hold up. And then suddenly your Smith is there and they can help them on site. And that's great, right? Uh, now, another kind of benefit that you could give is you could actually base a part, a portion or the occasional a story arc on the stronghold itself, as in the players are being haunted. And within strong, within the stronghold, there are specific things that like can uh, that can help them like a prayer altar or something like that right to have like an advantage on tax there uh they could be getting see besieged and then that would be such a fun like story arc where a stronghold can actually like they can build specific fortifications and and artillery to kind of fight against whoever's besieging them I think there's a lot that you can do to make it so like, Hey, the stronghold isn't just like a narrative place where they, they can say that they owned it, but rather it can actually be a part of the story. It can be a part of the story that they have to actively defend that they have to actively utilize. And I think that that is such a great idea. So in this next time that you have kind of a pivot in your campaign or, or for the next campaign that you make in the near future, just take some time, alter your trajectory and offer that kind of stronghold story arc for them. And then throughout all the rest of your campaigns, you'll be able to come back there and you'll be able to offer little improvements here and there, little additions to the player's experience. I think they'll have a really good time. So get out there, you know, help them build some strongholds. And until next time, let's roll initiative. Do you love these podcast episodes but aren't always able to listen to them? Do you learn better reading information rather than listening to it? Here's what you can do. Go to sessionzerostudios.com slash newsletter. Sign up for our weekly newsletter. You'll get tips and tricks sent directly to your inbox in written format that you can read and reference whenever you want. You'll get tips that we don't share on the podcast and bonus techniques that, frankly, no one has ever heard before. Again, sessionzerostudios.com slash newsletter and uh, get those free tips and techniques right to your inbox every week.